on WealthTrack Global Value Manager Sarah Ketterer on bear market positioning and opportunities. So we have to make sure we stay in defensive stocks, lots of healthcare, cash generating pharmaceutical companies, for example, and consumer staples, utilities, and then more defensive stocks within IT, information technology, and then gradually move more into these cyclicals because ev after every bear market, they have huge runs. A Morningstar International Fund Manager of the Year discusses strategies on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and it turns out the difference between a growth and value stock is two, with price as a key determinant. Some of the darlings of last year and much of the prior decade have recently been rebalanced from growth to value by a major index provider, such as the power of a bear market. Among the former growth stock stars of the Russell 1000 Growth Index that have fallen into the bargain basement Russell 1000 Value Index are Meta Platforms, the parent of Facebook, Netflix, and PayPal Holdings. They will retain much smaller positions in the Russell 1000 Growth Index just in case. However, GameStock, the first meme stock of the social media online trading frenzy, has been kicked out of the Russell 1000 Growth entirely into full value membership. There is a sense of finality in that decision. Well, these are stocks that a self-respecting value manager would not have touched with a 10-foot pole last year. Suddenly, they are value propositions, or are they? This week's guest is a well-known value manager known for her global and international investing. She is Sarah Ketterer, Chief Executive Officer of Causeway Capital Management, which she co-founded in 2001, and now has more than $40 billion in assets under management. She is portfolio manager for the firm's fundamental strategies, including three of Causeway's five mutual funds. Among them is the flagship Causeway International Value Fund, launched in 2001, for which she and her team were named Morningstar's International Stock Fund Manager of the Year in 2017, having been nominated for the same award in 2013. She is also portfolio manager on the Causeway Global Value Fund, launched in 2008. Both funds have gold analyst ratings from Morningstar. Ketterer is also one of Barron's 100 most influential women in U.S. finance. I began the interview by asking her why she says we are entering a new era in the markets. What's new is that we're in a new era of monetary policy globally, perhaps with the exception of China, where the central bank there is still in easing mode, but all others even recalcitrant Japan is in the process of tightening monetary policy. And this has changed everything. Why is that so huge? Liquidity creates excess bank reserves, creates lending, creates money velocity, creates then interest rates, interest rates fall when there's all that abundant capital. So that's when asset prices rise. And we've seen a solid decade plus of massive asset price inflation until recently. And now we're paying the price of having all this money created. I can remember talking to you in 2020 and you told me at the time, and this is when the U.S. big tech dominated, um, value stocks were getting crushed. Value uh, investors were underperforming growth investors by you know historic uh, margins. And I can remember you telling me that you had never felt so beleaguered as a value investor than you did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, leading up to 2020. So I mean, how are you feeling today? Valuation is back. So that's good. In that sense, I'm feeling encouraged because that means that the tools we use as a research team are now valid again. They were always valid. It's just the market didn't seem to want to care when when long duration stocks, those that produce earnings and cash flow, not today, not tomorrow, but sometime far in the future, when those stocks traded at massive valuations, that was really hard to stomach because that's just speculation. We have no idea if these companies can deliver. And as it turns out, the market's realizing that many of them can't. And they especially can't do so when interest rates are rising precipitously. So. Staying out of long duration, having shorter duration stocks, not dissimilar to the bond market, was 
the right strategy. It just took so long to prove that to clients and fund shareholders. And that's the agony of it. We know we're right. It's just that cycles can be longer than you have the emotional support to, uh, to make it through. Has the bear market created a, a bunch more value opportunities for you as a value investor? Oh, very definitely. It there has. Mm -hmm. Many more stocks to buy at very attractive valuations. And this is the other shoe to drop. The question is, as central banks are attempting to slow demand, slow economies, what does that do to earnings? It won't be good. And that's what the market's attempting to fathom now. This is the process of price discovery. Mm -hmm. So an advertising dependent stock, one like Meta, is there's a kind of shoot first, ask questions later maxim in investing, and investors don't want anything to do with it now because there will be a further slowing of advertising. My colleagues and I looked beyond the cycle. So we attempt to normalize earnings, to assume that there is a recovery, because there always is, mm -hmm. and then decide how we want to be positioned. If you're just thinking about the next three to six months, you'll never want to own a stock that is clearly cyclical. And we saw this in the late 90s. A lot of tech stocks turned out to be very cyclical, no different in this period of time, whether it be uh, communication services like a Meta or Alphabet, for example. They, mm -hmm. they have a lot of cyclicality embedded in them. And when times are good, people spend on their products. Their clients, advertisers, are willing to have big budgets. And when times are not so good, they cut back. That's a cycle. So that's part of the, uh, I'd say, not just the art, but the science of doing investment research is deciding how much of the past can be replicated in the future and, and how much of the future is new, is something we haven't seen before. And how do we model that? How do we estimate revenues and margins and earnings and cash flow? And then at, how do we discount that to the future? What sort of rate do we use? How conservative should we be about this tightening? This is going to be very significant amount of increase in rates or not. So there are a lot of assumptions. What are some of the assumptions that you're making? We're assuming this will be, a, if not a recession, a significant slowing of growth in the U.S. And that's not terribly unusual. I think that might be more mainstream. But we're hitting earnings hard. We're making drastic decreases to our assessment of earnings for some companies, especially if they're in very economically sensitive areas. And then some of them, for example, the stocks that have run well this year, really just one sector, namely energy, mm -hmm. those stocks are, many of them, their share prices have probably gone far too high for where the commodity is going to trade as demand slows. Think about it, um, less demand, less use of oil and gas, right. and likely there'll be some sort of commodity pullback. So then we have to look through that to where, would, if the stocks sell off, where we'd like to buy them again. For cyclical stocks, it's incredibly important to know where we are in the cycle and make an assessment, to your point, of where we're going. Right. And, and we may be in a couple of years of slowing. You, you have told your clients basically to prepare, uh, you know, to buy in a recession, mm -hmm. and and that you too have a listed causeway of companies that you are, are would buy in a recession. Uh, but I, my question is, you know, why wait for the recession? What, why not anticipate and buy earlier yeah. than that? So there are some stocks that are, that are very high beta. They've got a lot of market sensitivity. They may sell off very sharply. And it's a good idea to get started just doing so gradually. But it's difficult. If we buy too early, mm. clients think we, we've made terrible mistake and um, early is equivalent to wrong. So right. this is this is part of the reason to have a seasoned investment team and to understand how, especially with cyclical stocks, how they've traded in the past and what and what that might tell us about the future. I re referenced uh, my 2020 interview with you and that you know being a beleaguered value investor. And the fact that I remember you telling me about some uh, European banks that were selling at just ridiculously uh, low levels, and uh, and how frustrating that was. Mm -hmm. To your point, um, you know, you were owning them early, and they hadn't recovered. Are, are there any sectors now, uh, either here or overseas, that are ridiculously, uh, yeah. you know, priced? 
Across all sectors, we're finding mm -hmm. attractive really? stocks. I couldn't have uh -huh. said that a few years ago it, we, with a little bit more parsimonious. I'm convinced the single most important decision we'll need to make as a research team is to understand that turning point where the market yep. stops selling, stop pressuring the cyclical stocks, and then rewards them for their position. Think about early 2009. This, the second half of 08, the stocks that did the worst were very cyclical. Clearly, financials were bludgeon. But the first couple of quarters of 2009, you saw their recovery, and they kept going, and they kept going for a long time. So those cyclical areas that are doing poorly now may be carving energy out because it's got its own unique characteristics due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But the others, uh, chemicals and consumer discretionary, financials, the whole lot of them, they, they're ripe for a turn. It's just mm -hmm. probably a little bit early. And so we have to finesse this. We have to make sure we stay in defensive stocks, lots of healthcare, cash generating pharmaceutical companies, for example, and consumer staples, utilities, and uh, and then more defensive stocks within IT, information technology, and then gradually move more into these cyclicals because ev after every bear market, they have huge runs. And right. then, then the key is to get out of those and back into the more, uh, into a more diverse mix of defensives and cyclicals. Can you give me examples of some of the companies that you're in now that, that do have the defensive characteristics that you're talking about, uh, that, that you're comfortable owning now, that still as a value investor are still attractively priced? Well, we do like the European pharmaceuticals, and it seems mm -hmm. like almost all of them, from Novartis to uh, GlaxoSmithKline to AstraZeneca to Roche. They're cheaper than their US peers. Um, they have that Europe discount on them. And yet they have a significant 40 plus percent of their revenues come from North America. They are dollar earners. They get taken with the European brush, but they are innovative. And again, we like that cash flow, like the fact that that translates into dividends. And I used to talk about dividends. Even in 2020, people would fall asleep at their desk. And now they're <laughs> excited, like, ooh, cash, I want that. So, because again, with rates rising, now there's something to do with cash. Before it was trash, and it isn't anymore. And within technology, especially in the US, there are parts of the uh, tech sector that are very sleepy and interesting. Mm -hmm. And companies that are engaged in the some digital transition for their clients, or in business process outsourcing, companies like Genpact, for example, they take on various functions of their, their customers and then digitize them and automate them. And, uh, and it's a huge cost savings. And our view run by Brian Cho, who heads up IT for us, is that some of this, especially the whole digital transition, and this is true with our, our cloud transition stocks as well, like SAP in Germany, mm -hmm. there's a process of converting to a full digital operation Right, it just can't be stopped, even in an economic slowdown. And the conversion to cloud, given the cost savings involved in that, companies will pursue it somewhat regardless. Not entirely, but it creates some economic, some protection from the weaker economy ahead. You are global investors at Causeway. Uh, how do you compare the valuations uh, in Europe versus the U.S.? Well, it's a little bit difficult because they're, they, are comp they have a comp different composition. The U.S. market mm -hmm. is much more heavily exposed to information technology. It's two of like three times as much or four times as much. It's, it's a very different type of market, more communication services oriented toward Internet, whereas Europe's got more telecommunications. But to your question, International has for years traded at lower valuation multiples. And some of it, by the way, is justified, at least had been, because of the higher returns on capital earned out of the US. But what is that I mean, changing? It, well, perhaps. Mm -hmm. it, it may very well be changing, and we'll, we'll find out. But even if international, especially international developed markets, should trade at some discount to the US market, maybe just not so much and not several multiple points in terms of price to cash flow and price to earnings, maybe that ought to close. And that in turn will make non-US investing more attractive. 
But there's also the currency element. The US dollar is at a 10 year high versus its trading basket of foreign currencies with the euro being the largest component. Right. Now, some may say, well, that just means those economies are going to hell in a handbasket. It doesn't necessarily. It just means that real interest rate differentials are favoring the US now. But all those move in cycles as well. So the idea that you might have currency at, at, as a wind at your back owning international because the dollar is so strong now, maybe abnormally so, that the non-US currencies, their next move is likely up. We, we do know there'll be more fiscal spending out of Europe, which is necessary in order to provide energy independence. And a lot of that is quite good. If the race to renewable non-carbon emitting energy goes even faster, that means there are more opportunities to, to invest in companies around that. I, mean, I was thinking of one we have in our portfolio today called Enel. It, you're, it's an Italian energy utility and mm -hmm. they operate globally. They have a presence in North America. They, uh, they're one of the largest renewables companies in the world and unknown, which is why we like them. What are European companies of the, uh, the executives of the companies that you're invested in, what are they telling you about the economic environment um, and, and their business prospects? Mm. Well, most are talking about cost inflation. And then yep. also supply chain disruption. Uh, they're coming up with a million reasons to prepare us for what is going to be a <laughs> spate of disappointing earnings. Uh -huh. But they're, they're also the ones that, this is, this is sort of how we define value management. It's not just cheap. You can go out and buy an, a value index and be done with it and pay very little. But from an active management perspective, we want to find companies anywhere in the world. There happen to be plenty of them outside the US that have s some hurdle that they can overcome that we can push them to accelerate that. We call that operational as, restructuring. Uh -huh. well, one company I can think of that uh, most people have heard of is Philips. They used to make light bulbs. Right. But they're, they're entirely a healthcare technology company now and they are engaged in diagnostic imaging, so scanners. They've got all kinds of monitoring that they call connected care business, and then they have a consumer products business like toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes. And they made a sleep apnea device and turned out to be uh, problematic and recalled and lawsuits. And whenever there's litigation, investors run for the hills. But this company, when pushed by its institutional shareholders, has already shed businesses that were outside of its healthcare technology main core sphere. So it's already proven, the company and its management have already proven they, they're shareholder focused. And now we can f push them further to get them beyond this lawsuit and creating greater value for shareholders in the, in the businesses they're in. That's part of what makes value investing so incredibly rewarding is that it's not just finding cheap, it's creating a catalyst without having to look elsewhere. Like management is the catalyst. And as investors are pushing management to increase their efforts to generate higher margins, greater earnings, more cash flow is the secret to success. Can you give me like one example of a European bank that was responsive to you and, and that has become more uh, you know, focused on shareholder returns? Well, maybe the most controversial is Unicredit in Italy. It's not mm -hmm. just one of Italy's largest banks. It's got a large banking presence in Germany and Eastern Europe. And they had a banking presence in Russia, which is now nothing. Right. But um, with the Russian invasion, the stock collapsed again. We'd already cut our, our weight back, but we had a chance to buy it at 30% of its tangible book value, which is shockingly low. I mean, the implication when a bank trades at that level is that they'll never earn anywhere near their cost of capital forever, which is sort of unlikely. Um, otherwise, they won't be in operation. But, but we were pressing the prior CEO and the current one to ensure the bank didn't make any um, acquisitions. It'd be any part of the consolidation of the banking environment in Italy that could be unattractive for shareholders. We don't want to own companies engaged in what we call national service, where they're doing something that's good for the country, but not good for shareholders. And this is part of why corporate governance in, has always been central to great investing, particular value investing, where we're relying on managements to deliver, often in difficult circumstances. 
you are looking for opportunities in China as well. Why? What, I ask what? myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the situation in China has, as we know, lockdowns in Shanghai and partial lockdowns in Beijing and... Right, and, and interventions in... Interventions. In Oh my uh, goodness! Traded companies and yeah, there's a lot going on in China, which w would lead, you know, many just to say, you know what, let them do whatever they're doing, but I'm not going to play yeah. in that sandbox because I don't know what the rules are going to be. So, what's what's your assessment? There are ways of taking advantage of China without necessarily having to be fully exposed to China re regulatory environment, which has been a little hard to fathom. Mm -hmm. And the stock I'm thinking of is. Although not related to its uh, U.S. namesake, Prudential, a company listed in the U.K., but they too, with a lot of shareholder pressure from firms like ours, sold off their U.K. life insurance business, their U.S. life insurance business, well, spun it off, and and are left with a great Asia and Africa business. And they're, hmm. they, it's high growth as middle-income consumers go out and want life insurance or they want sure. savings products, health care supplement a healthcare product, financial product, they can get it from this company. But they are, but, but Pru within Hong Kong was selling po policies to mainland Chinese and the mainland Chinese aren't coming. They're sealed in their apartments. Well, they're stuck at home effectively. And this has created um, some concern about the company's growth rates. Will they be able to expand? Well, we don't think lockdowns are permanent. They can't be. That's the point of how we look at stocks. It's not just the economic cycle returning. There may be something standing in the way of a company's earnings that we think is temporary. So you can get a company like Prudential UK, attractive valuation, and well, the reasonable dividend, but the potential for quite a bit more because of the growth that they achieve in, in countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, the Thailand, and, and mainland China and Hong Kong. What happens if it gets these recessions get more severe? Then do you you just stay defensive and again you just wait yeah. until where you're in the midst of a recession in whatever regions uh, you're investing in and and that that's when you go cyclical. This is a very tough call because yeah. there are reasons why a typical recession or even just a downturn in growth maybe not even official recession, say in the U.S., could get much worse with exogenous events. Right. What's happening in Russia and Ukraine is certainly it's uh, not, not helpful. No. And Europe's slowing through the uh, difficulty of getting energy, at least through 2022. And China's property market and how that's weighing on their economy, it, you can get very depressed looking at all this. Yes. But central banks don't, they don't want to kill the economy. They have a dual mandate. It's inflation and full employment. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt that central banks will step in and, tr and attempt to, to smooth the way through. Right. If it turns out recession is much, much deeper and more severe than even they anticipated. So Sarah, what would your one investment be for a long-term diversified portfolio? I mentioned Philips earlier. Mm -hmm. That's somewhat unusual because it is not only not only does it did it has does it have headwinds that are surmountable, it has plenty of financial strength, but it also has, it's in a business that should continue to be in great demand over time. The diagnostic imaging business is one where, as long as the technology is at the forefront, we'll be using that type of equipment and skill set for years to come. So that would be the one I'd recommend today. Sarah Ketterer, thank you so much for joining us on WealthTrack. Thanks, Consuelo. At the close of every WealthTrack, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is prepare yourself financially for a recession. I've been around long enough to see the handwriting on the wall. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is telling us loud and clear, we can't fail on this. We really have to get inflation down. That means raising interest rates until he sees evidence that it really is coming down before we declare any kind of victory. As Wall Street's number one economist, Ed Hyman, told us a couple of years ago, when asked how do recoveries end, he said the Fed murders them by hiking rates. 
Well, this Fed seems intent on taking that risk to beat inflation. How do you prepare for recession? Cut spending, pay our expenses, revive some of your frugal stay-at-home COVID lockdown strategies to preserve capital. Morningstar's personal finance guru, Christine Benz, recommends setting aside a healthy contingent of safer securities like cash and high-quality short and intermediate-term bonds to tap while leaving more volatile assets in place to recover. If you are close to retirement, try to delay it or work part-time to delay withdrawing from a reduced nest egg. Delay taking Social Security benefits to get the bigger boosts in income. The most important step in preparing for a recession is to have a plan of action just in case. Hope for the best and plan for the worst. Well, next week, Matthews Asia's Robert Horrocks helps us invest in Asia, the world's fastest growing emerging markets region, while minimizing China's powerful political risks. In this week's extra feature, Sarah Ketterer explains why ESG investing has become such a big part of Causeway Capital's investment strategy. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a lovely weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.